it's with great pleasure that I'm, uh, I have a chance to introduce to you Antonia Perez, um, who has worked as a legacy specialist archivist for the past seven years and was trained through the Creating a Living Legacy program of the John Mitchell Foundation. Antonia is a mixed media artist living and working in New York City, who focuses on the reuse and transformation of materials. Much of her work has evolved from her process of collecting discarded objects such as used plastic bags, household linens, tissue boxes, and other materials that have a potential for conversion to something unexpected. Uh, Antonia has worked with numerous arts education institutions, notably the John Mitchell Foundation, the Guggenheim's Learning Through Art Program, the Studio in a School Association, Lifetime Arts, Elders Share the Arts, the Brooklyn Museum, or such as MoMA PS1. She has shown with the main window Brooklyn currently on view, and amongst other places, she has shown at the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling, the Museum of Art and Design, El Museo del Barrio, and Queens Museum. She holds a BA in Visual Arts and Arts Education from Empire State College, SUNY, and a Master of Fine Arts from Queens, Queens College, CUNY. Hi, and thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to see that so many people have um, stuck it out for the last presentation. I've enjoyed everybody else's presentations so much. They were so informative and a lot of connection to what I'm going to be talking about. And thank you so much, CODA and, and Residency Unlimited for inviting me to talk with you all today. Uh, career documentation is something that I believe is essential for every artist, but for most part has not been taught in fine arts education programs. Lately though, more and more artists are becoming aware that career documentation is something that they need to do. And many artists are wondering how to go about it. A lot of you may have some idea of what this entails, and you might be doing some of it already. And what I'll present to you today is an introduction to the process of career documentation with some practical guidance in how to enter into that process. I'm going to share my screen with you. I, um, I've been doing this, as you know, as, as Claudia mentioned, for about seven years. And I was trained um, through the Creating a Living Legacy program, which is also called CALL. I believe that I can make clear to you that caring for your life's work through this process is vital at any stage of your career, whether you're an emerging artist, a mid-career, or a well-established artist. During my presentation, you will likely have questions, and um, we have reserved time at the end to answer them, and I'll try and get to all of them if I can, um, put them in the Q&A, and I will take time at the end if you have more than there is enough time to get to. So um, when I first started working with Call, I worked with two older artists, um, artists who had work that was 50 or 60 years of work um, that had not been necessarily archived um, appropriately. I've also been working on my own archives for a number of years. And for the last few years, I've continued archiving the life's work of the late artist, Joe Overstreet. And I've had a number of opportunities also to consult with artists seeking advice on their own archives. None of this makes me an expert in the way that museum or library archives work. But this experience in career documentation, working from different points of view, with both living and deceased artists has afforded me a certain amount of expertise in providing guidance to artists who wish to enter into this process and who wish to enter into this way of thinking about their work. How does the career documentation connect to your legacy as an artist? Well, career documentation and your legacy are directly related. Here are eight points to keep in mind as you enter career documentation. And, um, you know, these are very wordy points full of a lot of facts. The first thing that you should think about is that you're preserving your legacy when every artwork that you have created, whether it be a painting or a photograph or a performance or a video or a digital work or a public project, every artwork is both documented, <coughs> excuse me, in a record keeping system as well as physically preserved 
where possible using archival methods. Two, a record of the, of the life of each of your artworks needs to be kept, including where and when it was created, where it might have been exhibited, published, presented, or performed, and with whom, and if and when it was sold, to whom, and when it was reviewed or recorded or mentioned in the public realm. Three, a record of and an archival file of papers associated with each of your artworks, publications, exhibitions, performances, etc. All those papers should be maintained. And if you use a lot of visual and or textual research in your work, you should keep a file of these things as well. A record of your associates and your contacts gathered over the years should be maintained and cross-referenced with your artworks, your exhibition, press, and publication records. That kind of leads back to things that, that uh, Krista was talking about in terms of the way you network and um, connect with people. You can keep track of that. Five, a file of legal documents should be maintained and documented. And when I say the file, I'm talking about the original papers and document a digital record of that. Six, your journals, your sketchbooks, your notebooks and letters should be stored archivally and documented. So that exquisite notebook that Zachary showed at the beginning of this day, um, he might photocopy it or scan it and keep a digital copy of each of the pages of that book, as well as archivally store it. Seven, photographic and videographic records of you with your art, making, performing, or presenting your art should be documented and preserved physically and or digitally. Eight, a file of monographs, magazine and newspaper articles, and so on and so forth, should be maintained in archival storage and documented. All of these things are part of your legacy. Career documentation is a system created to document all aspects of your career as an artist. It shows in detail the connections between your artworks, their existence outside of your studio, your contacts, and your papers. And this system is established through an archive. So why document your work in your career? There are a number of reasons for doing all of this. If you are an emerging artist or an under-recognized artist who has been working for some time, creating this archive will aid you in your applications and proposals and for grants and exhibitions and residencies and the like. As a mid-career artist, it can help you prepare an artist talk or a lecture about your work or provide images and data for an exhibition catalog or other publication. And when you are an established artist, your archive will aid you in planning a retrospective with a curator or survey exhibition of your work or assist an art historian in researching your work. And after you're gone, this archive of your work, your career, and its documentation, that's your legacy. It is what you've left behind, and hopefully it will continue to live in the manner that you have planned for. Most likely, you have all become begun some aspect of this process. Whether it be through photo documentation or maintaining records of your writing or your performances, other aspects that you've likely begun are through setting up websites or creating image lists or artist statements and art resumes. All of this is good start that can help in the creation of your archive. The Artist Archive has two essential components. The first is the physical inventory of the artworks, as well as the related materials that document your career, such as contracts, announcements, props, costumes, catalogs, published books, and so on. The second is the records that enable you to keep track of everything in the physical inventory and, in some case, digital inventory, as well as your works that may no longer be in your possession. The archive is structured so that the interconnectedness of your artwork the ancillary materials, your art career activities, and your contacts is easily understood and accessible and maintained, not just by you, but by others you may entrust with this responsibility. So everything that I've set up into this point may sound like a bit much. Um, I think it's a little bit overwhelming. And before I get started in how you get into this process, I wanna point out that for many artists, just thinking about this can be absolutely daunting. And the longer you've been creating, the more work you have to archive. 
I can understand if you'd rather just put it off for later. And you might think that you don't have time to do this because it takes away time from art creating. And I can totally relate to that. Uh, I really, actually, I loved what Lydia said about setting aside a small amount of time to do some of the business that she has to take care of for art. And this is similar. The problem with not doing is that the longer you put it off, the harder it gets. And as I've already pointed out, career documentation can really aid you in every stage of your career. And if you can find a way to incorporate it as a regular part of your practice, you will reap the benefits. The process can be fun, but it can also be tedious and emotional and even a revelation to you. And you may come across works you made years ago that you'd forgotten about, and um, that might take you down a memory lane, or you may discover threads of your work that you hadn't focused on before as you look back. And you may find contacts who expressed interest in your work and you never followed up. Um, you may find work that you wish you'd never made, and you may find work that sparks ideas for new work. The process of organizing and building your archives can also be life affirming and confidence building. And by doing this, really, you're showing yourself and your art the deepest respect and you're placing high value on your legacy. The way that you keep track of your physical inventory and your records, the way that you link all of your artwork, related ephemera and activities and papers is through an inventory numbering system. And before anything else, you need to figure out how you will number your artworks. That's one of the things that should be going on those crates when you ship that work out, is your inventory number. What information will be in that number? You can think of that number as the defining identification number of each work that can tell you the year that you made it, what processes or materials were used to make it, or if it's a particular, a part of a particular series. And if you made many works of that type in that year, which one it is. Of course, you can make up any format that works for you. But once you decide on the format of your inventory numbering system, making a habit of numbering every piece as soon as you finish it is essential. If it is a physical work of art, I recommend signing it and dating it and photographing it. And you can number it and put the inventory number in pencil on the back or the bottom if you can, or on a label on its wrapping and record it in a notebook or on your computer before letting it out the door. Include as much information as you can about the piece in that, rec in that record. Is it in a show? Is it being published or performed? Have you written any statements about it? Has someone else written something about it? For example, if it's a costume associated with a particular performance, you might code that into your inventory number. If it's a painting associated with a particular series, you might code that into your inventory number. Your inventory number should be basically a series of letters and numbers that describe the piece to you specifically. So how do you begin the career documentation process? Well, really, once you've designed the format of your inventory number, you've actually begun the documentation process. But beyond, beyond that, it helps to break it down into steps or stages. And the first step is to take a good look at where you stand right now. And you can perform your own needs assessment. Every artist will have a different set of circumstances. And um, there's really no one size fits all method, excuse me. But the things each artist should consider are your space, how to maintain your workspace, and also a place to do your archiving work, which really needs its own little corner or maybe big space. It really depends on your volume of work. Is it 10 years of work or is it 30 years or more? What kind of storage do you have and what kind of storage do you need? You need to consider your time. Just how busy are you? What is your schedule like? Where can you fit in archiving? What are the materials and resources you will need for this process, such as shelving, archival storage materials, maybe a new hard drive or a digital camera? Do you need or do you want assistance? If you're well along in your career and you have a large amount of work to deal with, you might want to consider getting some help right from the beginning. And I don't necessarily mean professional help. It could be a friend or a family member who can help you assess your needs and maybe take notes for you. Or if you have 50 years of work to deal with, <clears throat> I recommend looking into getting 
a legacy specialist from the beginning, even if only for an initial const consultation. It will be less overwhelming. And I'll say a little bit more about this later. So let's look at space. Think about how you are storing your work right now. No matter what type of artist you are, is your storage space satisfactory to you and is it safe for your work? Is your work protected from light, from extremes of temperature, dust, humidity, vermin? If you're a mid-career visual artist, you may need more physical space for storage than an early career artist or a writer, for example. If you're an artist with a lot of physical inventory, you, maybe you'll need more shelving or racks and maybe you can have a storage area for that in a separate location. You may have to set up an extra table or two if you have the room, or maybe you get a folding table that you use only when you're working on your archive. And you'll see why I think that you might need this in a minute. Or maybe your work table doubles as your archiving table, though that would be the least desirable situation for a lot of visual artists. In some cases, an artist's work exists on hard drives or videotapes and notebooks. You probably only need a small table or some shelving in a file cabinet if that's you, lucky you. In other cases, you may need to dedicate a whole section of your studio to the archiving process. So in this photograph, and um, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school by saying that this was Joe Overstreet's storage room when I first started the archiving process. And it was a lot to deal with turning that into something else, which is this. This is what the storage room looks like pretty much right now. Um, I'm gonna to refer to actually something that Lydia was talking about. If you can see on here, these kind of boxes that she was talking about, but on these boxes, most of them have two labels. One is a big inventory number with a title, and the other is a thumbnail image of the piece that's inside with the inventory number. It's very easy to track the location of your work if it's labeled like this, and that label is associated with a location in your computer. Um, same thing here. These are the kind of tubing that she was talking about and the kind of supports to sit on them so that they're not resting against the bottom of the shelf. And this is not for shipping per se. This is for long-term storage. So what you want to find out is, is your work easily identifiable and ac accessible in the way that you have it stored? Maybe you have room and not the appropriate storage system for your work. You think about the kind of storage that you need and according to the volume and the size of your work, something like this little shelf unit may be appropriate for very small works on paper or digital work. So you may have something on hand that you can um, transform into this kind of a storage unit or you may have to build something or buy something. When you think about the, the materials and resources that you have, you need to consider what work you have accumulating in your studio. Many artists have work that is not wrapped, sometimes lying in racks or shelves or boxes, but for the most part, not stored in an archival manner. Some visual artists have flat files for works on paper, and those are often stuffed to overflowing. And even if in your practice you don't produce a lot of work that takes up space, you may have a lot of related materials connected to your work as an artist. For example, a performance artist may have costumes and props, printed scores, maybe CDs, audio files, digital videos, um, computer hard drives. All artists have stuff they've created or have used to produce their creation. All of that stuff needs to be stored in a manner that will, be, that will preserve it for the longest possible time. And you may need to purchase archival boxes or wrapping materials, labels, extra hard drives. There are many companies out there that produce these materials and um, we've provided some links for some of those companies, um, which we'll be putting into the chat maybe a little bit later when I get to um, databases and such. Um, you may also have a large inventory of slides if you've been working for a long time and you have slides of your work. Um, this would be a good time to digitize that inventory if you haven't done it already. 
slides really degrade over time and you need to check and see if they are viable and test how they'll look digitized. The same thing goes for videotapes, but the same things also go for hard drives. Hard drives also need to be changed after a few years because they also degrade. Everything degrades with time. In thinking about paper storage, um, here's an example of archival boxes with very uh, loose labels. You'll notice that there's two kinds of labels here. On the smaller ones in the back, there's a title with an inventory number, but there's a big number label. And that is connected to the list in the database that talks about what's in each box. So there's different ways to store your information. Similar boxes are available in all shapes, shapes and sizes to store textiles or CDs or photographs and small objects. And when, when I refer to archival boxes, I mean the box is made with acid-free materials. Preserving your, your objects and your papers in an acid-free, dust-free, moisture-free environment preserves them for the longest possible time. And if your objects themselves are acidic, you will want to isolate them from other objects with individual wrapping or in separate boxes. In many cases, you can save money by order, ordering standard size boxes in preformed sheets and put them together yourself. But if you need special sizes, you may have to order, have them made to order, or if you're handy with a ruler and a blade, you can order large, plain archival cardboard sheets and create the boxes yourself. And these are not the kind of boxes that you would create if you're shipping, because shipping boxes tend not to be asset free. These are for long term storage that you keep in your studio. I should also mention that flat files come in many sizes are, and are incredibly useful for any kind of paper storage, whether drawings, photographs, or other paper documents. And you can also often find used ones on Craigslist here in the United States, but be careful that they are still in good condition because I've heard of people who've gotten things from Craigslist and discover that the drawers don't open or they're warped or if there would, there's a very good likelihood that they'll be warped. In New York City, where I'm located, there are warehouses selling used office furniture, and they often include flat files. So this is kind of my joke slide. Um, most of us don't have to punch a clock, but it does sometimes feel that way with all the things that we try to fit into one day. You need to Consider the kind of time you will be able to dedicate to the career documentation process. And I recommend starting slowly, but consistency, even if it's only an hour or two per week. You will make progress. And later, you may want to devote more time to it. Everyone works differently. Perhaps you are between projects and you feel like devoting a big chunk of, chunk of time to getting your archiving system and your physical space set up or maybe you have a couple of weeks to get it up and running. Either approach, whether going slowly or diving in, will work only if you keep at it regularly over time. I can't stress that enough. It's great to get enthusiastic and start and then forget about it for a year and you have to start all over again. So little bit over time, every week, every month, whatever the interval is that works for you, that's what you do. Um, we all need a little assistance. Um, sometimes we need more help than at other times. An early career artist without a huge inventory and maybe not a lot of disposable income may not be ready to hire professional help. But this might by, be the time to get help from your peers, your studio mates, mm -hmm. family, or members of uh, your community or an arts group that you belong to. You may be able to exchange their help with yours for something that they need. I really like bartering. Um, it's a good idea to get one or more family members involved at some point so that they can understand how your archive works and what your wishes are for your legacy. You may not be asking them to do any of the work, but you will want to show them or someone close to you, a trusted person in your life, the whole process that you're engaged in so that they understand what your wishes are.
If you have a studio assistant, perhaps you can enlist them to help you with the archiving process. But it's important to remember that um, archiving is a different skill set than what they may already do for you. Um, they may be an excellent Canvas prep person, but not that great on the computer or not very detail-oriented when it comes to paperwork. So if you have access to fine arts or arts history or arts management students through a local college, you might be able to arrange an intern in exchange for school credit. I know this is something that is fairly commonly done, but you should keep in mind that students in these programs often need income to survive. And if there's no payment offered, then only students who can afford it will seek these inter internships. So offering some payment is a good idea to get a broader pool of students as potential interns. And if you're in a position to contract with a legacy specialist, this can be the ideal situation for your career documentation project. You might wanna work with a legacy specialist to help you develop a project outline and a timeline, delineating the various tasks that need to be accomplished, especially if you're talking about many years of work. And this doesn't have to be for a long period. The legacy specialist can help you get started in creating your system and you can proceed from there, either on your own or with a little help from other folks, as mentioned before. You could meet with the legacy specialist again as a follow-up or a checkup. Um, I should point out that the Joan Mitchell Foundation on their website has a lot of resources that you can look to concerning uh, career documentation, legacy planning, and all of that. And they also have contacts with quite a few legacy specialists that they trained. You could contract with a legacy specialist to help you develop your career documentation plan and to help you implement it over time. But if you go this route, you're inviting another person into your studio on a regular basis, and you and that person will need to establish a really good working relationship. A legacy specialist has a particular skill set that includes patience and kindness and sensitivity and ability to see the big picture while paying attention to the small details. Good communication skills and dedication are part of a legacy specialist skill set. When a legacy specialist ar archives your work, they're engaged intimately with you and your creative life. And it will take time to get to know each other, to develop a working routine and to build trust. When a legacy specialist contracts with you, they're making a deep commitment based on understanding of your needs and the willingness to take on tasks needed for you to accomplish your goals. And keep in mind that if you want a legacy specialist to work with you 20 or more hours per week, that is no longer a consultant. You would be required to hire them and pay taxes and insurance for their employment, just as you would for an assistant who is working that many hours in your studio. I also want to mention that there are other kinds of consultants who can occasionally help you in this process by hiring them for specific short jobs needed to achieve your goals. And you might want to hire a carpenter to build out the storage for you, or you might want to hire a skilled computer technician to analyze your tech situation and make recommendations. And you might want to hire a photographer to document your work, or you might want to hire an art handler who will do most of the wrapping and packaging of your artwork. Um, I, I love working with art handlers. Uh, this is an art handler that I worked with uh, for a couple of years, but he works on a short-term basis and now he's moved out of New York, but he only deals with oversized or heavy work that I can't manage alone. Um, so that's how I you know, use the skills of an art handler when needed. You need to think about how you're going to set goals now that you've performed your initial assessment and you have a good idea of where you stand. And in the beginning, it's wise to make your goals small enough that you can achieve them easily. For example, in your assessment, you may have realized that you need more storage space or a new external hard drive for your computer. Your first goal, and I think actually, this some, Zach actually talked about setting benchmarks. It's a similar kind of thing. Making a small, manageable, goals or benchmarks that you can achieve based on what you need. So your first goal, for example, could be to research what is available for your needs in terms of storage. The second goal would be to ac acquire that storage unit or, for example, a hard drive. And your third goal 
could be to install it in your space. Whatever goals you set, they should be SMART goals. And this is terminology borrowed from the business management world, and it's still commonly in use. It serves our purposes perfectly, though. The goal is specific. You will research the types of external hard drives available to your specifications. It's measurable. You'll spend a certain amount of time doing that until you find what you want. And it's achievable. You know how to search on Google. You know how to budget. You know what you want. It's relevant. This will help you in your archiving process. It's time bound. You will give yourself a short amount of time or a specific amount of time to accomplish it and start immediately. Now I'm using this small, simple and obvious example because I wanna impress on you that while it's important to see the big picture, that can be so overwhelming. Taking small steps toward your bigger goals actually makes those goals achievable. One of your goals could be to make a timeline or a chart for yourself, outlining what you see as the bigger projects that you want to take on in the career documentation process. And if you do that, you'll still need to make smaller goals for each step of the process. For example, if your goal is to inventory all of your work from the past five years within the next year, you might make smaller monthly goals specifying which parts of your artwork you will inventory, record, and store in an archival manner. I personally like working with calendars and timelines and to-do lists, and they really do help me stay on track. The next thing you want to do is think about creating a schedule for your archiving project or your career documentation. When I first started working on my own archive, I thought I could dedicate one day a week to it. And I wanted to make up with, for all the years that I did no career documentation, but I soon found that one day a week was just too much for my schedule. I had too many other demands on my time. And I found that I could spend one whole day per month and an additional few hours in the week following that one day. On the other hand, I work one day per week on someone else's archive, but I get paid to do that. If you are in the position of being able to hire a legacy specialist to work with you, or you have the time yourself, you may want to schedule one day a week. That's pretty frequent. But you have to figure out what will work for you, and it may take a little trial and error to, to get that going. Even if you hire someone to do a lot of the work, you will still need to be available to them, and you will still have to direct the process. Selecting a record keeping system depends on what is comfortable for you. And there, there's some links that are going to be put into the chat. Um, I'm not specifically recommending any of these, but you want to try a few things out and figure out what, what works. Some artists do some record keeping. For a long time, I had one of those black and white composition books. And in it, I recorded the title, date, medium, and dimension of pieces that I finished. For a number of years, I did that. Later, I began recording those things in Word files. But I wasn't very consistent. And of course, there was no inventory numbers. When you think about all of the information that you want to keep on each of your artworks, it makes sense to use a spreadsheet program like Excel or a database program. If you're comfortable with a database program like File, FileMaker Pro or one of the commercial programs designed for artists and it fits within your budget, a database is very useful when it comes to establishing links between your artworks and all related activities, publications, associates, and ephemera. There's no point, though, in purchasing a database program if you're not going to use it. I currently use Excel myself. It costs very little. It's relatively easy to use. And for the amount of work I have and the size career I have, it makes sense. Also, if I ever wanted to transfer the data it contains onto a database program, I can do it. One thing I highly recommend, though, is to back up your record keeping system on more than one hard drive, kept separately as well as in the cloud. I've heard too many horror stories about people losing everything because they had no backup. Things happen that we have no control over and it's better to be safe than sorry. If you keep a handwritten written record, do it in duplicate and keep the records in separate places. 
So if you look at this sample Excel sheet of my work inventory, you can see that there are simple categories that give me all of the information that I need. There's an inventory number, an image date, dimensions, mediums. There's a thumbnail of the image. When I look at this, I can see that I submitted these top four collages to two opportunities. And I can also see in which statements I wrote about them. And these statements are also coded with numbers in the way that I number my pieces. It's important to know how many words are in the statement because so many applications ask for specific word counts. If this were an artist database rather than a spreadsheet, you would have pretty much the same information, but most of it would be linked within the database. So I could click on a statement link and go there, or I could click on the name of the place I submitted the work to and go to my application. Or if the work was in an exhibition, I could click on the exhibition title and go to a page that listed all the works I had in the exhibition. And that could lead me to other shows where I might have shown with the, some of the same artists or with the same curator. This is a sample database sheet. Now you can see that the format is very different than the Excel spreadsheet. It could be a good idea to try out one or more of the database programs out there. Some of them have a small free trial period that you can see if it works for you. And they might also have different monthly rates depending on the degree of service that you want, ranging from six to $20 per month. But be careful not to get one of the services that galleries and museums use. They are really not made for artists and they're much more expensive. It's important to track your progress as you're doing this. And I keep track of my progress, of my own archive, and in the work I do for other artists by maintaining a journal. And each time I work on an archive, I note down the specifics of what I did, where I left off, and what I plan to do next. And it's important to do that because in the inter interval between the archiving sessions, it is very likely that the little details of what you will do, what you were doing right then, will have flown out of your head. Write everything down, the inventory numbers of the arts that you, pieces that you worked on, the locations of things, what's been archived, things that you ordered, things that you left in whatever condition. All of that will help you as you continue in this process. And the other benefit of doing this, of keeping this record, is that it's a tangible record of the work that you've done in the process, the process that you've gone through to document your career. And it feels good to look back periodically and see how far you've come. So this is the part that um, we want to think about, but we don't. It's really important to think about what will happen to your work when you're gone. I'm gonna share a little story with you about a man I knew who was a painter and a textile designer this is many years ago. He did both things his entire life. He was a very successful textile designer, but he never got far career-wise with his painting. He, he died suddenly at age 62 of a heart attack. He had never made any plans for what he wanted to happen with his artwork after he was gone. He kept very few records concerning his artwork and also concerning his design work. Much of it was not signed or dated. When his wife died a few years later, all of his work, maybe a hundred or more paintings and a bunch of prints and drawings were still in the same places in their apartment that they'd been when he died. It was all left for his adult daughter to deal with and she had no clue what to do with it. She didn't know about any shoes, shows he may have been in. She didn't know about contacts he may have made in the art world. She tried giving away some of his paintings <laughs> to family friends, but it was difficult because the paintings were too big for many people's tiny New York apartments. No museum would accept any of his work because he didn't have a career. So she's been storing the work for 25 years. This is a huge weight on her shoulders, and because of her love for her father, she won't just toss the work out. This is something of a cautionary tale that I, I guess ha we have a few lessons that we can learn from this. One is that as artists, we must learn to periodically edit our work and toss out that which is not acceptable to us. 
Second, we must really keep good records about our work and career so that those who are left with it understand something about the context in which it's created. And third is that we must make plans and take one or more people into our confidence about our work so that our legacy is maintained. Now, I'm not comparing any of you to this artist. You have already made more progress in your careers than he ever did. But I'm suggesting that it is never too early to think about what you want to happen with your work. Where should it go when you're gone? And hopefully it all enters collections, museums, public institutions, libraries, and public archives. But what if it doesn't? Will you set up a foundation for your estate? Will you arrange for donations, sales, what? This is something none of us really wants to think about, but we need to do it. And the best time to start is now, unless you've already started. If you need help or advice, I am not available to archive anybody else's work, but I do do individual brief consultations and you can reach me at this email address if you're interested. I work for an LGBTQ archive where I develop the trans collections. I've never heard the term legacy specialist until your bio was shared today, and it has a beautiful and powerful ring to it. Please explain the nuances, differences between archivist and le legacy specialist. Um, that is definitely under discussion. I think the Joan Mitchell Foundation really came up with the term legacy specialist because they were doing a lot of work um, on artist legacies and especially working with much older artists. The Creating a Living Legacy program um, was a granting program for older artists in which legacy specialists who were trained by the Joan Mitchell Foundation worked with old, older artists to begin their career documentation and archiving pro process. An archivist um, might be a person who works in a museum or a library who is specifically handling works of, of a given period of a specific artist or a specific venue and uh, creating either a physical and or a digital archive of those works but not necessarily um, dealing with a lot of the different aspects of an artist's life and career. And hopefully that answers. Oh, and I see Rachel Alba definitely uh, put in the Joe Mitchell Foundation work there. Um, how do you document a conversation via emails during years with a recurrent collector? <laughs> that, um, if I have an email that I deem as important, whether it's for myself or for somebody else, I um, save it as a PDF on the, com on the computer and I create folders, uh, conversations with X, Y, and Z, or emails with so-and-so, or emails regarding a particular project. That's how I do it. Uh, there may be a better way, but that to me seems fairly simple. Um, could I give examples of database systems? Which software? I don't recommend any software. Um, I don't want to attach my name to any software, but you did get a list in the chat. I recommend trying out what works for you. And um, really, it's, it's such a personal thing. You know, the call program started out with um, its own database that the Joan Mitchell Foundation created for use um, with these artists. And I was using that database system. But because it was um, under construction, it was very buggy. And eventually, we stopped using it. So you know, if you're going to work with a database system, uh, you either um, have somebody build out a program from FileMaker Pro specifically for you, as I know one artist did, and train you on how to use it, or you buy um, a, a prepackaged program that you can learn how to use yourself if you feel comfortable with it. It really has to do with your comfortable level, comfort level and what you will actually use. Um, next question is, since everything degrades, how do you feel about storing things in the cloud? Um, I think you, that storing things in the cloud is absolutely wonderful, but it should not be the only way you store things because you have no control over the cloud. You don't know what's happening up in the cloud. You have more control over 
those um, hard drives that, you, that you're storing, because you can control a lot of things about the things that are in your possession and not what's out there. So use both methods. That's, that's my recommendation. Um, but as far as the degrading goes, you, you just have to change your technology periodically. Um, it's recommended that you do it every three to four years, that you upgrade to whatever the latest um, formats are. Um, is there any law or anything out there that can support you when having control of the contract, the contact of the final? Oh, are you talking about with somebody who buys your work? Yeah, this is a common problem that I hear about. When people um, have a work that's sold through a gallery and the gallery will not tell you who the purchaser is, um, especially in the secondary market, you may never know. But if your gallerist doesn't want you to have direct contact with your collector, I recommend trying to have a conversation, trying to um, maybe even sign an agreement that you will definitely not sell out of the studio to that collector, but you'd like to know who your collectors are. And if you're working on your career documentation, knowing who your collectors are is part of that. And you can explain to your gallerist, this is what I'm doing in terms of my legacy. I am trying to document my life as an artist, and that includes who has collected my work. And I promise I'm not going to solicit them directly, only through you. Try that <laughs> in your own words, of course. I have never used the Artiv system, and I don't know much about it. But there, the person who asked this question put the link in here. So anybody who's interested, and I'm interested, so I will check it out. Um, all right. Regarding the last part of my talk, could I talk about how to donate art? Oh, yeah. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. I know an artist, uh, uh, an Australian artist who lived for most of her career in New York City. She came here, I think, when she was in her 20s. And um, she decided to go back to Australia. Um, I think she had just turned 70. She had a huge career in Australia. She was very famous there. She had a show there every year, but not much of a career here. And she sold a lot of work there. But while she was living in the United States, she obviously she created a lot of work and she didn't want to have to ship it all back to Australia. So she tried to donate for a couple of years, she tried donating work. She was finally able to donate one piece that was related to jazz, she's an abstract painter, uh, to the Schomburg Library, because she had a relationship with the Schomburg Library. Now, and that goes back to what everybody's been saying about your community and your relationships in the art world, and how important it is to cultivate those relationships for many reasons for you know for having friendships for having people who understand you and you understanding them for um having people who can help you out and who you can help out and organizations and communities that you have a relationship with will want to have a piece of your artwork another way to go is um community centers you know not necessarily uh, relationships with art community but connected to something else in your life. Sometimes places, public venues will take a piece of artwork if it's not too valuable that they have to spend a lot of money for insurance or that they're worried about it being dam damaged. The last person said, we lend artworks to the community and accept donations. And that is a lovely idea of lending works to, to places that might like to have art on the wall but cannot. Um, afford to buy them. Uh, the, the question that I get most often is how to create the inventory number. So I am just going to quickly say that you can make an inventory, you invent it the way you want, but if you use um, two or three letters of your name and two numbers of the year the work was created and um, two or three letters that are code for either the medium or the, the series or the particular project, if it's part of a big project, and then um, two or three digits for the number of that 
project, the number of works in that project, it could be the first one in that year. So for 2022, um, I made a, a plastic sculpture and um, it was part of an installation. So I might have um, a three letter code for that installation. And I had eight pieces in that, but I didn't make them all in 2022. I only made three in 2022. So I'd have 0, 01, 02, and 03. But for 2021, I might have that same code for that same installation. And for 2021, I would have 0, 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, like that. So that's my way of doing an inventory number. But if you alternate letters and numbers, usually it makes it easier to read. You don't really need to use the four digits for the year. You could use just the two. Um, but try not to keep it, um, try not to make your inventory number too long. Sometimes with Overstreet's work, I have to um, use more description and make long inventory numbers because of the huge volume of work. I'm talking about 60 years of work. So there's a lot of repetitive stuff. Do I use any systems like Articheck? Thoughts on them for condition documentation, specifically regarding integration and using multiple platforms for storing art for artwork information. I don't use that system. I do a very cursory condition report on each artwork that I look at. A lot of work, specifically Joe Overstreet's work, has to be um, conserved. So a conservator is going to write a condition report after they handle it. And that will be included in the archive. For my own work, um, I take note of anything that's damaged or um, has any superfluous marks on it. Um, for plastic, I do make note of things that have degraded to different states. Sometimes things fade, sometimes things crack. So I definitely will write that. And I'm not sure about your integration and using multiple platforms for storing art for work information. What you put in the cloud and what you have in your digital record should agree and should be constantly updated. What the information that I keep right on the computer has to agree with the external hard drives that I'm constantly updating. So I'm not sure what else you're referring to. Um, there are other kinds of um, systems that you can use to keep your records but I'm using very simple systems and they are serving the purpose that I, that I need. Even for Joe Overstreet's work, who's, um, as I mentioned, it's a, a lot of work.